How do you do, everyone? My name is Mike Butcher. I'm the editor at large for TechCrunch, uh, a little blog you might have heard of. Um, it's fantastic to see uh, so many people here at Viva Tech. Um, I think this is kind of, uh, you know, definitely the premier event in Paris and in France for tech these days. Um, so my, uh, my pleasure to have a, a great panel here. Now, obviously, the subject, um, building unicorns outside Silicon Valley, is the kind of subject we probably would have really had a lot of angst and uh, over uh, a few years ago. But really, to be honest with you, it's no longer the case. It's quite obvious that you can build very, very large technology companies and platforms outside of Silicon Valley. The question is, what are the main hurdles, the obstacles, uh, and what are the advantages, in fact, actually? So um, we might as well talk about the unicorns first, talk to the unicorns first, because I think that the valuations are very much in that uh, arena. If I could t turn to you, uh, first of all, Melanie Perkins from Canva. Now, the interesting thing about Canva uh, is that, well, not only is it a godsend for someone like me who has absolutely no idea how to use Adobe Photoshop, but it also was built out of Australia originally. Was it Melbourne or Sydney? Sydney. Sydney. Okay. You wanted to use your microphone. Yeah, okay. Sydney. <laughs> and um, actually, I think Canva is a sort of startup that you kind of thought, oh, wow, they, yeah, they must be in San Francisco, right? Yeah, they must be pretty, yeah, yeah. It's an excellent platform. It's really top notch. And it just wasn't. And they quite clearly built out of Australia with really quite clearly amazing engineering talent. But did you find, um, when you were building it, did you find that sort of kind of quizzical look like you're not in San Francisco, that kind of thing, when you were building it? Absolutely. When we first started pitching the idea for Canva, I was rejected literally hundreds of times. Um, investors said that you, they literally rejected us for being Australian. They were like, you can't build a company out of Australia. Um, and I think that it ended up being completely to our advantage. So apparently in Silicon Valley, the average uh, retention rate for an engineer is 13 months. Can you imagine trying to build a, a company with a 13 month retention? So we are very fortunate that we have, we've got 600 people in our team now, um, and the, the vast majority of those are in Sydney, Australia. But we've also been able to tap into um, Silicon Valley and into those uh, ecosystems and that experience. So it really feels like we get the best of both worlds now. Fantastic. Um, and uh, did you do you? I mean, you have now raised um, capital in the U.S. as well, right? Yeah, we have a lot of investors from over in Silicon Valley, which has been great to be able to tap into their networks um, and to see so many companies. They've seen so many companies that have scaled, but it doesn't mean that you have to base your company there. In fact, I think it's very advantageous to not do that. Yeah, that 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 point about staff and hiring, I think, is. Uh, a very interesting one. Uh, there's a, a phrase that VCs like to use, but uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this, which is capital efficiency, correct? No. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I, I am familiar with Mike the term, drop. <laughs> of course, but uh, I think, uh, I think right now everything is, is focused on, on growth, right? Uh, and, and we are investing money just to make sure that we get growth. Obviously, efficiency is important. And actually, there's an interesting point, which is in Europe, I think there is more efficiency to capital than there is in the US, yeah. for sure. Because when you look at the prices of software development, it's about half, if not a third here, to what it is in Silicon Valley. The real estate price is a lot cheaper. You have a lot more government incentives. So all these are really great advantages of building a company outside of the US and in Europe in particular. You can actually get to, in my opinion, get to an IPO, get to 100, 200 million dollars of revenue with about half of the money that you would need if you were in Silicon Valley. So the question is, why would you do it in the first place in some respects, especially in 2019? Nicholas, you are at Storansky with uh, Revolut. You've built Revolut, which is a fintech startup. Now, I presume you're going to say that there was a huge advantage to building that in London because of the sheer amount of, of fintech seen engineers, uh, sort of technical understanding of finance there, correct? Or, well, gen uh, general, the, the big advantage to, be, uh, to build in London because of uh, light regulation compared to US and also passporting rights into Europe, so you can effectively cover 
the whole Europe, the whole like you know 600 million people, with just you know one license issued outside of uh, UK. So that's a huge advantage. In terms of uh, talent, to be honest, I still think you know in Silicon Valley talent is much better, right? So we are actually hiring across the globe now, so we bring people from Silicon Valley as well. Mm. Uh, so the, the advantage of UK is uh, also that you can hire people from all the countries and then bring, bring them to London. So we brought probably like, you know, a couple of hundred people there overall. And you, um, it's very interesting that you should mention passporting. And uh, those of you who are familiar with my Twitter feed will think that I actually no longer work for TechCrunch and I'm actually basically fighting Brexit. <laughs> but, um, but speaking about passporting and the advantages of that in terms of, uh, I mean, Business France now, you... Um, uh, Pascal, uh, with Business France, uh, recently some research came out putting France uh, in top five uh, attractive countries, correct, for digital uh, startups. Did, is that something that you feel that France has energized itself or something that all the amazing entrepreneurs here in France have done themselves with, without uh, government intervention or initiatives? No, I think it's essentially a little bit of the two, right? But it's clear that you've got right now a momentum like we have never seen, right? Uh, some of us has been on the scene here in Europe for 30 years. And what happens over the last four or five years overall in Europe, London starting, but also on the continent of Europe is unique. We need to actually, the point of this uh, panel is wrong. A year or two years from now, we should not even more ask the questions. Yeah. The hot yeah. stuff is that Europe has got so much to offer. Uh, this is a continent which is essentially 500, 550 million inhabitants. We've got today the ability to hire the human capital that you want. You come from Moscow. I was based out there. You're in Australia. So what's the point? So I think it's yeah. starting to be insulting that we continue to ask about whether or not Europe can build unicorns. We're doing it. You've got 30 plus right now unicorns. We're building uh, by the day, some of them. Uh, talking of my own country, right? In France, we had last year, 16, uh, 12 only uh, capital raise above 40 millions. Just in the first three months of uh, this year, we already have nine. And what we're doing, coming back to the passport, right? We have the French tech visa, and France is doing the exact opposite of what Trump administrations, Orban and few others are doing. We're welcoming people. Yeah. Uh, our prime minister stated loud and clear that from 340,000 students, foreign students in France, we want to reach out half a million. We are clearly very proud of having up to 41,000 PhD doctorate not being French. So at Station F, you know, 300 accelerators and incubators, we are actually, actually clapping with our hands when people can over and want to create a company here. Yeah. So that's the mind state which has take, clearly illustrated by President Macron yesterday on stage. And we're going to essentially switch gear and push more to get more of these so-called unicorns. Well, there you go. That's a, uh, very difficult to argue with. I must, I must say, uh, just briefly, that I think I must say I really do applaud uh, France's uh, strong position on uh, liberal democracy and rights, human rights, and and being open. In when this, are you moving from London to Paris? Right, that's what you should do anytime soon. No comment. But. Um, but, but I, and I, and I, I, we have also, I'm involved with a thing called Tech Fugees, which is about refugees and technology, and Paris has been very welcoming to that initiative. But let me do, be very briefly skeptical, uh, uh, Melanie and uh, Bono. One, one of the issues in uh, technology, especially in high growth technology companies, as you all are very familiar with, is scale. And one of the issues is that you can take two companies, both doing similar types of things, but if one company raises a lot of money, that is more likely to beat the other one because it's just going to have better access to resources, it'll have more firepower trying to hire talent, uh, it can just do more, basically, because it has more, more gunpowder in the gun, as it were. But so, I mean, you've raised you know, multiple rounds, you're now a unicorn. But no, you are one of the leading, if not possibly, uh, I would say, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit biased. I'm not, so, you're pretty, I'd say, one or two, first or second in Europe for the later stage. You're, you think you're the first, especially for later stage. But when, when European startups, for instance, and startups outside, uh, outside the Silicon Valley, such as in Australia, when they want to raise this large amounts of capital, Bs, B rounds, C rounds, D rounds, 
they kind of have to go to the States, right? They have to be in Silicon Valley. So building, you can build, sure, outside Silicon Valley, but when you really want to raise those big amounts of that capital, you've got to go to Sand Hill Road and walk down Sand Hill Road or drive down Sand Hill Road, drive down to the 101 highway and raise that money, right? So are we ever going to get into a position where you don't have to do that? No. No, I mean, I think right now we live in a global world and the capital can come from anywhere. Right. It doesn't really matter. Uh, obviously, you have capital in Silicon Valley that has seen a lot and grown companies a lot, so they come also with a lot of, uh, I would say, intelligence about how to scale. But as a European company, you can find your capital anywhere you want. And to me, what's really important is you shouldn't be stuck uh, in any way by the place where you started your business from. You start in Paris, you start in Copenhagen, you start in Amsterdam. The world is at your disposal. You, it's not because we are European that we have to go one country in Europe at a time. So I start in Paris, then I'm going to do Germany, then I'm going to do UK, then I'm going to do Italy. And in the meantime, you have the same company or the, uh, the competitor in the US who's raised a bunch of capital, maybe more than you, and just conquer the US right away and become a lot bigger because it's easier, it's more homogeneous, it's faster, potentially not in, in FinTech where you have to do things state by state. But in general, uh, the US is a larger, more homogeneous market. But as a Paris-based company, you should think global from day one and go to the US. Go to the US, uh, not, it doesn't mean that change your headquarters, but Conquer the U.S. as quickly as possible, so you get the first mover's advantage, and then you rapidly can do it. At Business Objects, which is a company I started in 1990, we were 10 people in Paris, just 10 people. It was, we were barely one year old, and we started office in Menlo Park, and actually in, in here at the same time. And then a year and a half later, we were doing 40% of our business in the U.S. We were number one in the U.S. We would not have done that if we had done the European step-by-step -step expansion. And Malin, what do you think about that, the idea that, um, you know, raising, raising ultimately you're going to go to the States? Yeah, I think it's kind of interesting. So in our early days, we struggled raising capital. We were just rejected by every single investor under the sun. Um, and I, had to, I spent six months in San Francisco just going to everyone, every conference, talking to every investor. Um, and eventually, after three years of pitching investors, it landed our first uh, round of capital. But now things have changed a little. And we actually have a lot of Silicon Valley investors and investors from across the globe coming to fly to Sydney to come and pitch us. Yeah. Um, so actually, it's a lot easier to do, get that scale up capital than when you're actually trying to get things started. Um, I think there is, though, one really key ingredient that Silicon Valley added to us that um, it, they don't have a monopoly on it, but it's something that was really critical. So in our, I've bootstrapped a company for five years before we started Canva, which was the same thing but for school yearbooks. Um, but going to Silicon Valley for the first time, it made me realize something, that nice, normal people were creating world-changing, multi-billion dollar companies. And so I met uh, Lars Rasmussen, who co-founded Google Maps, and it completely changed my mentality of what was possible. And I think that being able to have people thinking on that really, really large scale and getting as much um, of that influence into, a, into the companies, into the startups, into the ecosystem, it makes all the difference. So it took us, like, you know, with our first company, we were sort of just doubling every year, which was awesome, but it was like quite a small company comparative to what we've done with Canva. And I feel like that was the special magic that Silicon Valley added. I see. So you, you built and you built a big company, but yeah, you, got, you did get that extra push actually at the end. Yeah, from, just from uh, being in the States. Absolutely. It just changed our mentality because we rather than be like, I knew very clearly in my head, this is the future of design. This is the future of publishing. But actually going to Silicon Valley completely and meeting all of those amazing people and people who'd actually scaled up companies meant that we were able to take that mentality on board. Yeah. And I think that was pretty critical. So culture was interesting. Nick, with Revolut, um, you've actually gone into the States quite quickly, actually, relatively speaking, after launch. Well, we, we still haven't launched in the U.S. Uh, well, you certainly announced that you were going to go. Yeah, uh, yeah. Only so last hof year. hopefully this year. Uh, my point is that capital you can get uh, money, you know, everywhere. You can get like in, in the U.S., in, in Europe, even now in Japan. Uh, so capital is not a problem. I think you know people uh, hiring you know great people is a problem, right? So if you're based somewhere like in a, in a small city or small country, it's quite hard to hire like you know on big scale. 
right? Yes, you can, you know, find like 10, 20, 30, 50, maybe 100 bright people, right? But like when, when you need thousands of people, then you really struggle. That's why I think in US, in Silicon Valley, because it, uh, it has, you know, such a big concentration of human capital, you can really scale companies, you know, very, very fast. But what, what do you think about, I mean, Manny made a very good point earlier about uh, the uh, amount of time you have to keep uh, talent. What's the average time? 13 months? Yeah. It's 13 months is the average time that an engineer... In Silicon Valley, not at Canva, just to clarify. No, not at Canva, <laughs> but Silicon Valley. 13 months is not a very... I mean, in, isn't there a huge advantage to European companies that engineers I'd rather have 1,000 engineers for 13 months than you know, one for 20 years, right? Well, yeah, I mean... but. That, it does seem to be that there are sort of some big advantages to being outside the valley. But what, it's, what about in um, France? I mean, what about the role of governments and the role of, uh, the role of uh, authorities to be able to sort of promote environments? One of the advantages that has often been said to me about Berlin, for instance, is that it, there isn't really much government support. I, I think the, the mayor of Berlin famously once said that uh, we are poor, but we are sexy. And uh, <laughs> it's a strange thing to say for a mayor, perhaps. But what it meant was, was that there wasn't any real support. So there wasn't, so when you did a startup in Berlin, you just did it straight. You didn't have any kind of artificial encouragement. Mm. So the question is, is can you, do you end up artificially stimulating an ecosystem? No, I or, think... Or does it, can it survive on its own merits? No, as you understand, I come from the private sector, right? So anything which is related to government, I start with the minds, do we really need it? And now what I've started to discover, talking of Berlin, Berlin you had something very unique. They had cheap real estate. Right. And that was the start of everything. They had also the Feyenoordstadt of Berlin, which was essentially 70,000, 80,000 students on a campus. They had also a very decentralized country. And it happens that because of the strength of the German economy elsewhere, Berlin didn't have its fair share of economy. So it was the natural place where you go there. And then you had also the role model. Now, when you look at that, at what we have in France, really what we have, we have a kind of a virtual circle. It all started by recognizing on publicity making that um, digital is not something anecdotal. It's going to go through the line. And in this respect, the, the mindset, which is the entrepreneurial mindset, has changed dramatically. I'm, um, I'm, I keep quoting this amazing data, right? Just five years ago, 10 years ago, you would ask to the 18, 25 years old French what they wanted to do later on. Less than 13% would said, I want to become entrepreneurs. In just five years, you had 60%. Now, you two are playing the role of the role models. We finally understood that the model was not anymore the brilliant politicians or civil servant, only the CEO of a large company, but that the entrepreneur, the successful entrepreneur, was we wanted to put in front of our teenagers and young adults. So the role model is one. Then you need to also recognize, talking about the handicap we had to the valley, that we need to redirect some of the saving, the money. In this respect, we have in Europe, essentially, a huge saving into the households around the place, right? Up to 15%. So what the government needed to do is to redirect this. And that we use a classical French way of doing it, different than what you do in the Anglo-Saxon world. We use the BPI to basically redirect that and support the fast growth of the venture uh, capital economy. So the second one is that you redirect the capital. But that's not enough. You need a lot more than just capital and the mindset. You need also the ecosystems, hence the ability to find the range of suppliers, uh, the, the capital, the human capital out there, and be able also to have this mindset to export. And that's where we create the French tech. Suddenly the French find themselves under one banner. And God knows that was something new, right? At Business France we talk about the Team France for that, export. Do you think that really helped? It helps tremendously. Because with also the gimmick of being at the CS, being the second, third largest representatives out there with in excess of 400 companies, we suddenly exist or said to the world that aside of the US, we were the second largest representative out there. And last but not least, when you got all of that, you need to repeat the cycle, right? So you need to demonstrate that your role model, which got the capital, benefit for the ecosystems are going to make. And the time we are right now is this. We need to make a handful of unicorns from France and I don't want to talk about France, I want to talk about Europe, successful. And we want to be extremely welcoming to you so that you can put a headquarter, the minute you've done it in the US, the same way we want you to come in Europe 
ID obviously in France, but if not, you should go somewhere else. If you do all of that, I think we are going to be even more successful. Well, I, I mean, I appreciate the, the, the branding, but as obviously as a skeptical, that I think that's the reason why most, most uh, evil guys in the movies are always Brits, because we're just, we have this kind of skeptical point of view, which is that, uh, because it's all very well, you can, you can brand everything, but ultimately it's about, it is about the companies, right? I mean, if you look at it, if you look at the actual data, London, and I would say this, wouldn't he? But if you look at the data, the data is, says that the UK and London produces the biggest startups in Europe. It does. No. I mean, that's why, that's why you're in London, surely. Yeah, but I think things are and changing a lot. You don't need branding think, for that. You yeah, just have the companies. For sure. But I think if you look at the history, London were the first, or the UK were the first to recognize that startups were going to be a really important part of the economic growth. And that was triggered by the financial crisis in 2008 because you realize we depend too much on the city, we need to do something else. They had no choice, they, they, they did that. Now, later on, other, country, other countries and other capitals in Europe recognize that. And now you have, you have London, but you also have Paris, Berlin, etc. And it takes time, right? So now you have, a, because London was there a bit earlier, these startups that were started early now are, have the size and so on. But if you look at the momentum of startups coming from London, Paris, Berlin, to, to Copenhagen, and so on, it's the same. And I think we're, right. we're, we're seeing the same kind of momentum with same kind of excitement. Uh, I think what's, what's clearly needed, I think, as, as Pascal said, you need to have this, the, the role models. We're seeing more and more role models. And by the way, if you look at where do the big, the, last year we had $50 billion worth of IPOs from European companies in just one year. Where did they come from? You had Spotify, Adyen. Spotify is New York now. Yeah, but originally it's, it's, a, it's a Stockholm company. Then Adyen is a Netherlands company. Elasticsearch, Amsterdam-based company also. And then you have Farfetch, London. But so out of five or six, you have one coming from London, and you have the other ones coming from all over the place. Startups and unicorns can come from all over the place. What we need is, I think, uh, is a, an environment where the key elements that, are, that facilitate the growth of these companies are there. I mean, you think about it, it's human capital, financial capital. And so human capital, we have to be able to bring in a lot more people from outside. It's been, in the past, it's been hard. I mean, you try to recruit a, a, a super senior manager from Silicon Valley into Paris, super hard before because of perception, brand, but also tax. We still have a, uh, you know, some things to do, but we can now. We're starting to see a lot more uh, Silicon Valley people coming into Europe. And financial capital, we, you know, we need to have Americans as well as all sorts of uh, investors put some money into the, 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 uh, the venture ecosystem, as well as the European LPs. There's plenty of European money I'm telling you, I'm spending quite a fair amount of time talking to investors, asset managers, telling them you need to think about technology, not just a, a little upside on the side of the portfolio, but as a strategic component of your asset allocation. Hopefully, with time, it'll, it'll work. Um, but you, have to bring, you said you have to bring the talent in. How are you going to bring the talent into the UK when uh, uh, they have, we're going to have all these new strange visa requirements? Well, I think, first of all, that the, the talent can come anywhere. I mean, we're... we're European investors. We happen to be based in London, but we do actually invest all over Europe, and we invest a lot in France or in the Netherlands, Scandinavia. I think there, there will be a competition for talent. If the UK wants to have the best startups, they're going to have to be continuing to be the best place to attract outside talent. And I think right now they have a lot of competition from Paris and others. Fair comment. Now, we talked about building these companies, and it's quite clearly you can do that outside the valley. We know that it's taken as red, and I, I agree with you. I think let's not run this panel again. This is going to be the last unicorn panel outside Silicon Valley, because we know we can do it. But the other thing is, that, is the question which remains, and I think especially in Europe, which you never really quite cracked as much as we would like, um, even with the launch, for instance, of high-growth sectors of the London Stock Exchange, for um, high growth IPOs, in the end, you want to do an exit. There is, that is the point of doing a startup, really. Um, and yes, you can raise the B rounds and the C rounds now in Europe much more than you used to be able to. But ultimately, to exit, to create exits, you need acquirers or you need an IPO, right? And so there's two problems that we haven't really cracked yet, 
which is the IPO aspect, which is, tends to now still be the NASDAQ exit as opposed to a European market exit. And the second thing is uh, the acquisition. And so, for instance, we know with Revolut, you're going to, in, to the US. I'm sure you're com having lots of interesting conversations with uh, people over there for, at various levels, either investors or, uh, or, or what have you. But, um, you know, you'll, you'll probably exit in the US, will you not? Yeah, probably. Next question. Um, <laughs> I love, I love interviewing Russians, don't you? Um, <laughs> the next, uh, but when, what about you guys? Or you, you have um, US investors. Yeah, I guess our theory is always just take the best from wherever it is in the world. Um, and so that's finding the best investors. That's a very diplomatic answer. Yeah, but it's also very true because I don't think there should be this either or all sort of competition thing. It's about like how can you solve your problem the best way possible. And so for us, we had a big problem that we were trying to tackle. We we're going to have to have the best people from across the globe to help um, deliver upon that. Um, actually, on the topic of acquisitions, we actually, as of today, announced two amazing acquisitions that we've just made. Um, Breaking news on stage. Breaking news right here, right now. Um, so Pexels and Pixabay, um, two of the largest stock photog free stock photography sites in the world, have just joined our team, which is very exciting. So there are certainly um, acquisition opportunities, especially as we start to see more unicorns and more big companies. Um, of, you know, we're starting to become almost, you know, we're starting to get, get into the, that category. Um, the more large companies are around, then the more ac acquisitions can be made. And we're just looking for the best companies across the world to join our team. Well, you have a war chest now to be able to do the acquisition. Exactly. But you're the acquiring, but where, who's going to acquire you? Oh, hopefully no one anytime soon. We've got a huge amount to do. We feel like we've done 1% of what's possible. And so if we can actually achieve our entire vision, that would be pretty epic. Right. I think to your point, Mike, this is, this is really important, uh, is who are the acquirers? And in, in, in order to have the full ecosystem, I think we have like 75% of the ecosystem right now. We need to have very large European tech companies. You talk about exit, I think we need to have companies. But Europe think, has big tech companies. Well, but not that many. We, you know, SAP is one. It's the only really, really big one. Yeah. You know, it's the number one market cap in Germany. It's a very large company and it is acquirer, but it is a company that is here to stay forever. What we need is to have companies that are based in Europe, stay based in Europe in terms of their headquarters, so, and, and that, that believe that they will continue forever, that they will become the next Microsoft. Not like, oh, well, our exit is that you know, we, uh, we're going uh, uh, to sell to someone else. Because th this is by having headquarters that you have also spin-offs and you have the virtuous circle that Silicon Valley has, has created. So we need to find a way so that these companies feel okay with staying, with their center of gravity staying in Europe. And that, uh, uh, to be honest, as uh, us venture capitalists, for the past 10 years, we, um, we did a model where we take the European company and then we transfer the headquarters to the US because it's a little easier and then the exit will be in the US. I think in the future, and uh, we're applying that, which is say, stay here, you can now, you can attract talent, you can attract capital. Obviously, you need big businesses outside in Asia and in the US. But you can stay here and then start spinning off companies in here. And that will actually feed, in my opinion, the long-term model of Europe. But I, uh, if I may um, add my two cents on this, right? I mean, so what you're stating is the fact that today uh, it's easier to get an IPO uh, in the U.S. in many respects, or is actually what you see as the natural uh, path. But the truth is when you talk to many of these investors, they tell you that the amount of IPO will actually overall be a much lower part of the exit, that the private holding will continue with events to create liquidity which is needed, and that you've got so much um, money and dollars and savings which is out there that it will not be the natural one. And the second idea that I would like to interject is so that... So you think the, the, the whole idea of an IPO is actually going to be downgraded? And it's a fact. Today you've got a, a very strong... Uh, slowdown of IPO in the US, right? Uh, John Chambers has been stating here in these panels uh, last year, we see it. So that's the first idea. The second idea is that um, at the end, you also have a corporate world. And today, when you look at the Fortune 500, right, for our own rights in France, we've got 28 of them, which are French companies. These guys embrace now the digital revolutions. 
they've got 10 years after the great financial crisis, they've got immense balance sheets and a need to go out there. So I believe that what we should see in the next two to three, four years is to have the large company being far more active, proactive, at trying to go for excellent growth. So I think if you take the two in together, yes, no one will object to the place of the US. We're trying to fight here at a Europe level, uh, working on the regulations to make it easier. But of all the things that are changing, changing even into uh, Americas, which I think is something that we should take into account. But, the, um, and, but the, also there is a, a kind of an open question. The elephant in the room is the exit to some extent, I still, I think, especially in Europe. And I think also that if you th look at something like VivaTech, which is actually quite interesting as an event, because unlike many other conferences around Europe, and I, for my sins I go to a few, uh, this interesting sort of interplay between the corporate world and the startups, where you, know, you, have, you look at the, the, what's going on out there, and you see Huawei, SAP, uh, IBM, Google, etc., big companies, and then underneath them you have all these startups. But what we want is them to start buying some of these companies, right? Not just partnering, not just being a distribution platform, uh, not just like giving them some free AWS cloud software, but we want them to actually acquire, don't we, don't we Bernard? Yes, I mean, uh, we do to some degree, but I think to me, again, what I would like is to have more SAPs. We need to have 10 SAPs in Europe, not just one, because it, it's, if you look at all these big companies, big tech companies, yeah. how many are European tech acquirers? Very few. Right. But, it's, but we're not going to have them until you have a number of entrepreneurs who say, this is my life mission to build this company. I don't care about an exit. Exit, it doesn't, I mean, maybe for my investors, right. I can find an exit. It's the wrong, not maybe it's the, is it the wrong the, attitude? The, well, the exit have. is a really bad word to me because, yeah. and, and by the way, I mean, IPO versus m and The m and is very, very different. m and is the end of the story for the company. An IPO is a milestone to become the next Microsoft, the next SAP. And that's, that's what we need. Even if it doesn't turn into a pure IPO, we need to encourage every entrepreneur here in this, in, in this conference to think like, I am going to be the really, really big company that is going to be there for the next 50 years. I think that's what's interesting about the Australian story, it's about as far as away from Silicon Valley as you can get, is Atlassian was obviously a, a huge success. And now actually, when you think about Atlassian, you think, yeah, Atlassian, it's up there with SAP or, or, or the, biggest, the biggest technology companies in the world. And, um, and yet that, that came from Australia. And, uh, and so the unicorns exist. Not only are they unicorns, they're, uni they're now part of the furniture. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to I'm going to pose a slightly different concept, which is that I think that it does take a country to raise a unicorn. And I think it does from all sorts of different perspectives. So it does from the education perspective. So if you're in school and you're just learning to rote learn, you're probably not going to be wanting to go and start a company, like trying to put as much problem solving into the school curriculum, trying to get people to be thinking about the UN Sustainable Development Goals and how they'd yeah. solve them. I think that's a really critical part. Having the media actually be interested in startups will mean that people are hearing about them and getting inspired to actually go and start their own thing. There's so many different aspects which are absolutely critical. I know in our first round, the government in Australia matched our funding, which actually was the reason why we were able to start our company in Australia was because they gave us matching funding. So there are so many different things that are actually required to help, help get a startup off Well, the I'm ground. glad that you end, ended with the on, on the note of the media, because being in the media, it's been exciting to watch uh, mainstream media get so excited about startups over the last 10 years after banging that drum for a few years myself. But for now, ladies and gentlemen, I think we should, we need to wrap up, but please thank our panel and we'll see you later at VivaTech. <laughs>